Wednesday night. We're looking tonight at Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9, verses 32 through 34. And I've mentioned before that Matthew chapters 8 and 9 contain a series of clusters of miracles that are interrupted by certain sections that have to deal with discipleship. So it goes something like this roughly. Miracle section one, discipleship emphasis. Miracle section two, discipleship emphasis on through. There seems to be an intentional organization of the miracles of Matthew 8 and 9 into uh, symmetrical groups in that they both contain uh, five miracles each. There are tradition, the way it's traditionally numbered, there are 10 miracles in Matthew 8 and 9, five miracles in each chapter. Now, I don't say that to suggest that Matthew organized them in that way. Why would that be a foolish thing to say? Matthew did not include what? Chapter divisions. Yeah, the chapter and verse divisions of the Bible came much, much later. But the church, uh, when it organized the scripture in these sections, uh, organized the, these two chapters to contain five miracles each. So Matthew chapter 9, uh, verses 32 through 34, contains this, the account of Jesus healing a demon-possessed or demon-oppressed mute man. So let's begin and hear our text, Matthew 9, verses 32 through 34. As they were going away, um, behold, a demon-oppressed man who was mute was brought to him. And when the demon had been cast out, the mute man spoke. And the crowds marveled, saying, never was anything like this seen in all Israel, seen in Israel. But the Pharisees said he cast out demons by the prince of demons. Many, many years ago, the church used to observe something called Oculi Sunday, O-C-U-L-I. This is in the Christian calendar, the third Sunday of Lent. Now we're Baptist people, that doesn't mean a whole lot to us, but there is such a thing called the Christian calendar and we kind of as Baptists choose selectively what we want out of it. Christmas and Easter mainly. And then if you're uppity Baptist, you do Advent. And then if you're real uppity Baptist, you might observe uh, Pentecost or Epiphany. After that, you've got to become an Episcopalian. It's a joke. Anyway, so there are all of these events. And then by the way, we badmouth the rest of the calendar while bringing in things from the American calendar and trying to act like they're sacred. Mother's Day, Father's Day, <laughs> all of the patriotic holidays, all of which I love, but let's just be clear, we kind of, Baptists are kind of eclectic in what they choose to appropriate from the Christian calendar. But Oculi Sunday was an interesting Sunday. I wanna read for you a description of what this Sunday would have looked like. Uh, the following is from a pastor named uh, Mason uh, Beecroft. Listen to what he says. 1,500 years ago on Oculi Sunday, Oculi is Latin for my eyes, right? If you found yourself in the city of Rome in 1,500 years ago, 1,500 years ago, you would witness a large procession winding its way through the city. The procession would be led by catechumens. These were people who had been trained and taught in preparation for their baptism, which occurred on Easter Sunday. The early church used to baptize one Sunday a year, and it was Easter Sunday. Uh, before this day, these candidates would have gone through instruction in the faith and been subject to a series of exorcisms. I want you to understand this, because this will sound very unusual to us. There was a period of time in the church's history in which all baptismal candidates underwent exorcism and a series of exorcisms. A late 5th century letter from John the Deacon offers some insight. This is what John the Deacon wrote in the 400s. There is no doubt that until born again in Christ, one is held bound by the power of the devil. 
Indeed, one thus bound should not approach the grace of the saving bath. What was the saving bath you think he was talking about? Baptism. Unless renouncing the devil as part of the early rudiments of faith, one is extricated from his snares. On Oculi Sunday, as they entered into the sanctuary, after the procession, they would pray, quote, my eyes are ever toward the sanctuary, uh, my eyes are ever toward the Lord, for he shall pluck my feet out of the net, turn yourself to me and have mercy on me, for I am desolate and afflicted. On and on it goes, and one of the recurring themes throughout this early practice of baptism in the early church was an emphasis that when you came into the Christian church, you had to renounce the devil. And in fact, part of the baptismal process was to, you had to, you were asked by the minister, do you renounce Satan and all of his pomp? And you had to say yes. And then you had to spit toward the kingdom of the devil. So they had a real keen theology of the devil. And what I find interesting is that we have an, a, a theology of the devil. Probably all of us in here, if you're a believer in Christ, believe that the devil exists. And yet we kind of hold it a little bit tenuously. We don't quite know what to do with the devil. If you talk too much about the devil, we'll begin to whisper that you might be a Pentecostal. If you never mention the devil, we'll begin to whisper that you might be an agnostic. So a Baptist is a person who believes in the devil enough to say he believes in the Bible, but not so much that people begin to whisper about him. But I thought about this when reading our passage because it is saturated with an awareness of the devil and of Christ's power over him. In fact, a number of these healings in Matthew 8 and 9 go hand in hand with the act of exorcism. If you think back over the last number of weeks that we've worked through these two chapters. And then I think about the last 48 hours. In the last 48 hours, I've had two conversations with people seeking counsel. And I found myself saying without any sort of premeditated determination to do so, you know, we do believe that the devil exists. And cautioning these folks I was able to talk to, to beware of the devil. And I think that's important. In Matthew 9, verses 32 through 34, we see a man who is subject to the devil's attacks. And then we see Jesus delivering this man from the devil's power. So there are four portraits in this passage, even though it's only three verses. And I'm going to briefly flesh out the four portraits. The first is the victim, this man who is a mute and possessed by a demon possessed of a demon. The second is Jesus the Savior who has power over the devil. The third is the adoring crowd who celebrates this moment. And the fourth are, is the Pharisees who have a very different understanding of what's happening here. So I just kind of want to work through these. Number one, the victim, a pitiful demonstration of demonic attack. Look back at verse 32. As they were going away, behold, a demon oppressed man who was mute was brought to him. Now, the word mute is the Greek word kophos, K-O-P-H-O-S. And it's interesting, Homer uses the word kophos to refer to a dull dart or to the earth itself in the Iliad. Meaning one of the ways you come to understand how ancient people use words is you look at how they're used in non-biblical or extra-biblical writings. In wider usage of the term, it was oftentimes used to refer to someone who was mentally dull, what we would call mental illness or someone who has mental health issues. Kofos referred to mental dullness. In scripture, the same word has a twofold meaning. It either means Deaf, which seems to be its primary usage, or mute, we know that because Matthew uses kophos. Clearly, it is in reference to a man being mute because when the demon is cast out, he speaks. 
But this has led a number of earlier interpreters of the Bible, like St. Jerome and others, to argue that while the scriptures does not, do not say that he was deaf and mute, it can be assumed. So we know he was mute. Many of the early church fathers argued that he was also deaf. But notice also that this was very debilitating because he had to be brought to Jesus. As they were going away, behold, a demon oppressed man who was mute was brought to him. The idea seems to be that such was his debilitation that he could not get to Jesus on his own. Now what's interesting for our purposes tonight is to notice that his being possessed by a demon is linked directly to his being mute. We know that, again, because when the demon is cast out, the first thing the man does is speak. So one of the things I want to point out is that we do have a biblical rationale for believing that some illness, some sickness, some infirmity is in fact demonic. But as we said probably three or four weeks ago, that does not that mean that all illness is demonic. And we know that not all illness is demonic or all illness is a result of sin because of Jesus and the man born blind. When his disciples say to him, who sinned, this man or his mother, that he was born this way, Jesus said, it wasn't that even this it wasn't that either this man or his mother sinned, but that God could be glorified. So I think this kind of helps us flesh out a good theology of Satan and illness. And I believe what you will find if you study scripture is this. Illness is a condition of the modern world. People get sick. Sometimes they get sick because God may wish for them to be so in order to magnify his glory. Sometimes they get sick because God has allowed the devil or demons to attack someone. Think of Job. Job did bear in his body the marks of God's permissive activity with the devil. So I just want to caution us when someone says, and I have literally, literally had this said to me in the city of North Little Rock, Arkansas. If you truly believe in Jesus, you won't get sick. When someone says that, they are saying something that is not true, not biblical, not right. So could it be that your illness is, is a demonic attack? It could be, or it could be that you just got sick and the devil has seized on that fact to agitate you and attack you. This seems to be a case of demonically inspired illness or rather an infirmity, he is mute. So what we have here, first of all, is a victim. He's a victim of satanic attack. But then secondly, what we have here is a beautiful picture of Jesus. The second portrait is of the Savior, an astonishing display of sovereign power. But watch what happens in verse 32 and the beginning of verse 33. As they were going away, behold, a demon oppressed man who was mute was brought to him. And when the demon had been cast out, the mute man spoke. Now, what do you notice there? What's missing in the beginning of verse 33? What's missing is any account of the actual healing, right? It assumes the healing and it just says when the demon had been cast out. Other times you have very vivid descriptions of Jesus spitting in the dirt and making mud and rubbing it on people's eyes right? Of Jesus touching people, of Jesus being touched by people. Think of the woman with the issue of blood who touches the fringe of Jesus's cloak and she's healed. But here we have no record at all, no description rather of the actual healing. Now there's two reasons for this. The, I'll start with the second one first. The second one is because Matthew is bringing to close or to conclusion, a certain section. He's been dealing with a series of miracles and he's bringing it to a conclusion. 
And the main reason he doesn't belabor the details of the healing is that he wants to get to the reactions of the crowd, I believe. He's trying to say something about how this polarized the common person over against the religious establishment, the crowds versus the Pharisees. But think with me a minute about what I think is the first reason, and that is this. Sometimes you say more by saying less. I think there is something really, really cool about the fact that in miracle number 10, I think Matthew knew that we were going to spend months working through this at Central Baptist Church. I, I don't actually think that, but there's something powerful about the fact that by miracle number 10, it's like Matthew saying, I don't even have to give you a picture of it. By now, you know, Jesus has, has authority over all illness, all sickness, all disease, all infirmity. At this point, saying less is saying more. He just does it. There's no longer an apologetic impulse to explain it. It just is. If you don't believe by miracle number 10 in these two chapters that he can do it, if you still need explanation, you've missed the point. Jesus is so awesome, it's just something he does. I think that's really cool, by the way. So look at this. As they were going along their way, going away, behold, a demon oppressed man who was mute was brought to him. And when the demon had been cast out, the mute man spoke. And what did the mute man say? We don't know. But I like to think that he said, thank you or praise God. It's a tantalizing, I mean, think about it. This whole little section has two tantalizing omissions that pique our curiosity. The details of the healing and the content of the man's words. We don't get a description of how he was healed and we don't get to know what he said. This is very similar to Jesus with the woman caught in adultery when he kneels down and writes with his finger in the sand. It's, it's tantalizing because of what we do not know, which is what he wrote. Here too, we don't know what he says, but here's what we have. We have a possessed mute man. We have an allusion to his deliverance. And then we have him speaking. He is healed. Jesus is a healing God. He is the God who heals. I told a story that was intended to be funny on Sunday about me healing a poodle. Remember this? It's a powerful story. I don't, I don't know that Brooke O'Brien believes me. She's a veterinarian, but I, I just want to say that I'm going to take credit for it. <laughs> I'm really not. It did happen, but I give credit to the Lord. But afterwards, I did receive word from a church member, and I think I was too sarcastic or something, which happens frequently. Ronnie says it happens very frequently. Amen. Yes. She says, well, I'm in, she's like, a lot of people don't know when you're joking and when you're not. This is what Ronnie tells me frequently. I'm like, I've been here almost 10 years, Ronnie. They should just know by now. And she said, you know that thing where like 10 people are laughing and everyone else looks confused? I was like, yeah, I like that. She said, that's when they don't know. <laughs> well, I, I wasn't joking about the poodle at all. That, that literally happened like I said it. But I did receive word from someone who, who wanted to know, were you laughing about it because you don't actually believe in healing? So I just want to make very, very clear. I actually do totally believe in healing. I believe God can heal. I pray frequently for God to heal. I prayed this afternoon at someone's bedside for God to heal him. I absolutely, completely. So I just want to say that for the record. My finding the healing of the poodle to be kind of a funny story, I just do. I don't know why. I just find it hysterical and funny. But it's okay to find certain things in the kingdom of God very funny, and you can still believe in the thing that happened. Right? I mean, look at ourselves. I find myself ridiculous. But, I, but I'm glad to be here. You know. So... Jesus, Jesus, Jesus heals. The third picture is of the crowds. 
the crowds, a rightful acknowledgement of the uniqueness of Jesus. Now, like I mentioned before, I think what one of the things Matthew is wanting to do is draw a contrast between, quote, the crowds who are beginning to see Jesus for who he is and, and are elated and the Pharisees who are furious. Watch the crowds, verse 33. The crowds marveled saying, never was anything like this seen in Israel. Again, it's a simple statement. This is a very simple section in terms of its language. It's just kind of boom, 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 boom. This is what they said. Never before, never was anything like this seen in Israel. Now that's an amazing statement because these are Jews saying this about Jesus who was likewise a Jew. And they're saying never was anything like this seen in Israel. But in the Old Testament, there are numerous miracles. God did healings through the prophets. There are also exorcisms in the Old Testament. So think about that. Somehow, the crowd gets that there's something different and unique and authoritative and powerful and awesome about Jesus. They get it. They see it. I love how John Chrysostom put it many, many years ago. He said, the statement bothered the Pharisees because the crowds placed Jesus before everyone else. Listen to how he describes this. Not merely before people who lived at that time, but even before all who had ever lived. And they put him first, not because he was healing people, but listen, but because he healed easily. He healed quickly. He healed countless cases of disease. He healed diseases that were incurable. Hence, the people reacted in this way. I love that point. The point is that he was doing it so much that Matthew doesn't even have to describe it anymore. It's just what he does as he moves through the area. And as, as he carries on his days, Jesus heals. He is so powerful that it's no longer big news for him. It's just who he is. I love what John Stott said about Jesus. He said, quote, we may talk about Alexander the Great, Charles the Great, and Napoleon the Great, but not Jesus the Great. He is not the Great. He is the only. There is nobody like him, he says. He has no rival and no successor. Dallas Willard put, quote, he is simply the brightest spot in the human scene. There is no real competition. So the crowds get it. Now, one of the things I want you to kind of pick up on in the end of this, it's not just a distinction between the crowds and the Pharisees. I believe it's a distinction between the common person and the religious elites. Or, to put it in Baptist terminology, the people in the pew and the seminary graduates. Common people seemed to get Jesus, didn't they? I mean, people were drawn to him. Now, tragically, many of these same people will be yelling, crucify him. But even then, we learn in the Gospels, it was at least in part under the instigation of the religious leaders. The crowds were drawn to Jesus, but the last portrait is of the Pharisees, the fourth portrait. The Pharisees, the blaspheming madness of the threatened elites. The blaspheming madness of the threatened elites. Verse 34. But the Pharisees said, he cast out demons by the prince of demons. Now Jesus will address this in some chapters to come. We're not going to unpack his response tonight. I just want to let the contrast stand the way Matthew lets it stand in, in his gospel. The crowds see it and they marvel. The Pharisees see it and they are ticked. How does that happen? How does one person hear about Jesus and their heart melts and another person hears about Jesus and it's heart is stone? I mean, there's a mystery there. If you're a reformed person, then you say it's the mystery of election. And I personally believe properly understood, of course, in 
election. It's the properly understood part that people will kill each other over. But notice how one group turns toward Jesus and another turns away. But here's the tragedy. It's the religious people who hated it. Why? I agree with those who say because deep down they thought it should have been them. They followed the rules. Heck, they made the rules. They were the most educated, at least compared to the common man, right? I mean, the Pharisees were, were highly educated, we would say. The scribes maybe were more so. They were pious. Jesus will constantly point out their hypocrisy. However, I, I do believe that we have to be careful not to be unfair to the Pharisees. Not all the Pharisees were the terrible creatures you see in their worst moments in the New Testament. Do you think there were good Pharisees who were good men who were following God as best they thought? Well, yeah, certainly. I mean, not, not every preacher is Elmer Gantry. Unfortunately, there's too many Elmer Gantries, but not every Pharisee was the worst Pharisee. But the Pharisees that approached Jesus, these guys, and they miss it. And they miss it because they're proud, because they're jealous. Who is it that Jesus just won over? The crowds. You want to know a way to make a minister hate you? Start a church down the street and start winning the crowds. Why is that? I mean, it really makes you wonder what we're in this for, the clergy, the professional clergy. I shudder to think of that. I mean, do you have a calling or are you just trying to keep your crowd? These guys, jealousy certainly had something to do with it. But I, but I want to I conclude by, by posing this to you. What if... One of the things Matthew's trying to do in telling the story the way he did, because Matthew wrote this, it's true, it happened, but he's structuring it in this way. What if Matthew is indeed trying to ask us this question? Which response do you have when you see Jesus at work? I mean, do you love it? Or do you secretly hate it and fear it? I love what Frederick Dale Bruner put. I'll, I'll leave you with this. Matthew, like all good evangelists, is asking at the end for the hearer's response. Decision. He presents the tenth miracle in order to fashion, as it were, an altar where those who have been attracted by Jesus through these stories may come and confess their readiness to believe. In this miracle, it is we the listeners who, if mute or tongue-tied, are invited to speak up with the decision for Christ. I think he's right. The work of God in Christ is always polarizing. And history has shown that it's always the most religious people that are really frightened of it. That's why the old distinction between a religion and a relationship is so essential. You weren't called to be a religious keeper of the, of the code, right? Ministers are fishers of men, not keepers of the aquarium. That's what they teach. But people are like, well, we want to pay you to keep the aquarium nice. No, but God's always working beyond the aquarium. So do you see that and do you love it? And do you celebrate it? This is an awesome passage. And so the choice is ours. Who will we follow?